Hey, welcome into the Joel Klatt Show. I am Joel Klatt, and I cannot wait for this edition of the show. First and foremost, uh, rate, subscribe, join us here every time that we drop an episode. You can follow me on Twitter at Joel Klatt. You can follow the show at Joel Klatt Show. But today we are going to be talking about the national championship game. We're going to preview this national championship game between TCU and Georgia. Uh, This is a true David and Goliath, right? We don't get this very often in a national championship game. Not not with the way college football is built. And and we're going to get it. And this is fairly exciting, right? Because um, I've got some thoughts on Georgia and some thoughts on TCU kind of specifically, and then maybe how this matchup is, is going to play out. Let me start with with Georgia because Georgia is is trying to do something that has become increasingly rare in college football, and that is to be – Uh, a back-to-back champ. Now, we've seen it before, of course, yes, uh, but it doesn't happen very often. And in particular with the quick cycles of personnel in recruiting in college football, that's one of the reasons why it doesn't happen. And they are dominant, totally dominant. Who's been the best team in the country the last two years? Georgia. And, and to be honest, it hasn't been all that close. In fact, if you look at their last 33 games that they've played, they're 32-1, and one, and that semifinal game against Ohio State was only the fifth time in those 33 games that they trailed during any point of a fourth quarter. That's pretty special. This is a dominant bunch. Kirby Smart has done, done a phenomenal job. Only Alabama recruits really on their level. You know, those two teams recruit at a totally different level. I guess you can say Texas A&M did for for a little bit. You know, Ohio State has had classes that have been up there. But year over year, these are the two teams that pull in the most amount of talent. And and Kirby has done a, a wonderful job of, of making sure that they are a balanced team, both offensively and defensively. And I know they – I think that they probably get a bad rap for being a team that is – we're just going to run the ball and we're just going to be about defense. That's that is not true. In fact, there were only four teams in the country that that you could say this year um, they they were throwing it for over 265 yards and they were rushing it for over 200 yards. Like that's pretty good balance. And only four teams can say that. By the way, two of them are in this game: TCU and Georgia. Oregon can say that, and uh, Florida State can say that. So. They've achieved some very good balance. They've also got balance on defense. While they didn't have great sack numbers for the entirety of the season, they have been able to put some pressure on the quarterback uh, during the course of of big matchups, namely Tennessee. They got to Stroud a few times in big moments, um, so they can put pressure on the quarterback. Their best trait is their ability to just stop the run with those defensive tackles, guys like Jalen Carter in there. They build that run front, and then they're fast. I mean, they are fast. And that's one thing that I'll also talk about with TCU is that these are two of the fastest teams in the country. And and I'm not talking about just speed on the offensive side, although they both have that. I'm talking about speed at the second and third level on defense. I think it separates each of these teams, and it clearly separates Georgia. Georgia is, is a team with an immense amount of speed, and that speed allows them to make up for mistakes. Every defense is going to make up for mistakes. And every defensive coordinator will tell you, like, listen, we don't get to punt on defense. Like, our mistakes don't end in us just saying, like, well, well, you know, kick it away and rely on our defense. There's nothing to rely on for a defense other than the end zone. That's it. That's it. That's all you can rely on as a defense. And so the only eraser that you have is the ability to run. And Georgia has that. So even when schematically they're misaligned, which rarely happens, or if somebody doesn't do their job, or if they get beat, what they can do is they can get the ball to the ground and live to snap it another day, generally speaking. And the reason they can do that is speed. And I think that's their superpower on defense. Even for for everything that they do in the defensive front, which is strong, very strong on, on the defensive line, their ability to run is, I think, what really separates them. Then on offense, what they are is balanced. I just talked to you about that balance, their ability to throw it and run it. I think the guy, obviously Stetson Bennett plays well in big moments. Okay, So so if we just say to ourselves, do we think Stetson Bennett's going to play well? I do. I absolutely do. 
He generally does in big moments. When you look at the last six games against top 15 teams, this guy's been outstanding. Over 70%, over 280 yards, I think 16 touchdowns. Um, I think only one interception during that time frame. Like He's been outstanding in, in big moments, and this is a big moment. But I think the actual key to being a really good balanced offense is actually having the hybrid H-back or tight end. When you look at really good teams as far as their ability to run it and throw it, they, generally speaking, have a good hybrid-style tight end, and that's exactly what Georgia has, and really a great room of tight ends. But Brock Bowers allows them to do things both in the run game and in the pass game that make them dominant. Um, there's clips from the SEC championship game of, of him just owning, in run blocking, just owning the edge defender. The edge defender who's responsible for outside contain has to keep his outside arm free. Brock Bowers owns his outside arm, mashes him down, and the ball jumps outside for an explosive run. Right? Like that's that's really good. Now, generally speaking, tight ends that are able to do that and are great blockers are not dynamic in the passing game. It's so rare to find a guy that can do what he does in the run game and come out and be a total matchup nightmare in the passing game. And he's able to do that. He can split out as a wide receiver. He can beat you. He understands nuance. He understands timing and spacing against zone. And then you can put him in line as a traditional tight end. And then he becomes a real matchup nightmare because it's like, well, who do you put on him? Okay, fine. Put a linebacker on him. He's just going to run right by that linebacker right down the seam of the defense. Like the guy is a heck of a player and he's the catalyst to their balance. Their tight end room is the catalyst to their balance because they can stay in a run heavy set or, or a run personnel or even an 11 personnel and run the ball effectively, but they can also throw the ball effectively. And I think that's what really uh, makes Georgia dangerous on the offensive side. So that's them on offense and defense. I talked about their speed and obviously the way that they've been so good in their last 33. So let's talk about TCU for a moment. TCU shouldn't be here. And, and that's not a knock. I'm just saying, like, college football is not built for Cinderella runs. Um, the more often you play in this sport, the longer that you play, the cream really should rise to the top. Now, having said that, I think we severely underestimate what TCU is from a cumulative talent perspective. Our metrics in college football of how we rate rosters – I, I believe is outdated and we, we need to start to view rosters and evaluate, I think is, is the better term, evaluate rosters better on a year in and year out basis. Because the fact of the matter is, is that if you actually evaluate the way that this team has played and what their transfers, namely on the defensive side of the ball have done, this is a much more talented roster than what we would have given it credit for at the beginning of the year. That's in large part why they were unranked to start the year. By the way, they're trying to be the first national champ that was unranked in the preseason since 1990. That was a split title, by the way, between the University of Colorado and Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech started that year unranked in the preseason and the only reason by the way they can call themselves national title is that there was a certain coach from Colorado's rival Tom Osborne that switched his coaches poll vote after the bowl game which gave Georgia Tech the nod in the coaches poll only and why Colorado was not the unanimous national champion in 1990. So you got a, a, a one poll split champ in Georgia Tech is the last time then an unranked team has actually won the national championship. Now, it happened a couple of other times in, in the 80s. I believe Clemson in 81. I want to say the BYU team in, in uh, their title, um, they, they were unranked to start the regular season. But again, this is a totally different era of college football. We live and breathe it a, a lot more from a 365 nature now than we used to back in the 80s or even in 1990. So this is an anomaly 
And, and I believe that we're heading into an era in which it's incumbent upon all of us, me, me in particular, but all of us as college football fans, to try to evaluate rosters more accurately for what they are currently and not what they were just when these kids were coming out of high school. And I think that we're going to get towards uh, doing that here in, in the coming years. This team was 5-7 and seven a year ago. Last team to play for a national championship with a, a record that was that poor was that Auburn team, who I believe won three games before making that wild run uh, under Gus Malzahn to face Florida State in the BCS national championship game. Uh, that national championship game was won, of course, by Florida State. Now, what is TCU? Well, TCU is very explosive on the offensive side. They're balanced, like I talked about earlier when I was talking about Georgia. They can run it. They can throw it. Um, and then on defense, here's what they are. They're opportunistic, but they are tough as nails. They're tough. And guess what they can do? Run. So they make up for some of their mistakes. They make up for the fact that they might not be the most dominant defensive front by running. Their linebackers, fast. Safeties, fast. They can run. They've got a really good cover corner in Tomlin, uh, uh, Tomlinson, Hodges, Hodges Tomlinson. Sorry, I, got, I butchered the, the order of his name there. So that in, in a lot of ways, these two teams can in, in some ways mirror each other because they are fast on defense and they can be balanced on offense. I think that the difference is, is that TCU can be wildly explosive on the offensive side. In fact, when you look at, at their ability to create not just explosive plays of 20 or more yards, but like I'm talking about home runs, 50 yards or more, they've got 21 plays this year of 50 yards or more. That's a lot. That's a lot. Speaks to the speed that they have on that side of the ball, the aggressiveness of their play caller, Garrett Riley, um, their ability of their quarterback, Max Duggan, to throw the ball with efficiency down the field. He's one of the best in the country at throwing the ball down the field 20 yards or more in the air and, and has a high completion percentage. I believe it's still over 50%. So th this is a guy that knows how to do it. He's a Heisman finalist for a reason, and they've got a really good wide receiver in Quentin Johnston on the outside. Some believe, and I'm starting to fall into this category, that Quentin Johnston might be the first wide receiver taken in the NFL draft. And, and so let's, let's lead into now. All of those things are true about each of these teams. I think it might be a closer game than we anticipate. I, I get it why Vegas has the line where they're at. I get it. And, and by the way, if Michigan and TCU play 10 times, Michigan probably wins seven of those. Okay, that's but that's fine. But they didn't last week. Why? Because TCU made the plays. They stopped them on fourth down. They got the fumble inside the five. Uh, they were able to make those big plays. When, when Michigan was having to sell out in the third quarter in particular on defense, TCU took advantage because they have the speed to take advantage. And they've got a quarterback that didn't pa panic in the face of pressure, was able to retreat and dump the ball off, and then a guy like Johnston takes it the distance. So why do I think this game could be closer than, than we all anticipate? Well, TCU has kind of exactly what you need to threaten Georgia. I talked about this at length before the semifinal between Ohio State and Georgia. To beat Georgia, you have to, have to, have the ability to run the ball at least somewhat effectively. You don't have to dominate clearly on the ground, but you've got to at least keep them honest with your run game. And then you've got to have players on the outside that can win one-on-one -on -one matchups. Really one. you got to have one that can go win one-on-one -on -one matchups. If you have that, here's what happens. One, you can create big plays. We saw that with Jamison Williams last year for Alabama. We saw that with Marvin Harrison Jr., by the way, in that semifinal. But also, that player changes how Kirby Smart has to defend. And so they have to start borrowing from areas of their defense, and it opens up other areas. This is why Xavier Johnson was having a big day for Ohio State when Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, was still on the field. That this is why they were able to move the ball and have some effective run game is because what Kirby Smart will have to do is borrow, keep a safety over the top of Quentin Johnston, possibly, or like he did against Marvin Harrison, and it opens up other areas of the field. So that player is vital 
to manipulating Georgia's structure in order to have success on the offensive side. And then you've got to be able to do that. How do you do that? Well, you've got to have a quarterback that can throw it and run it. And that's exactly what Duggan is. I was worried for Ohio State that Stroud wasn't going to have the ability to threaten Georgia with his feet. And I was dead wrong. He did. To the point where he put them in position to potentially win that game, albeit a long field goal. Duggan's a much better runner, I think we would all agree with that, than Stroud. Now, is he quite as efficient and as good of a passer? I'm not sure. I will. I, I know one thing, though. He's not going to back down. He's not going to back down. If, if, if you were asking me, like, what quarterback would you put out there against Georgia in the current state of college football this year, knowing what you know, I would say, like, well, Caleb Williams, obviously. I love I loved Drake May. I, would, I think he would have maybe some success against Georgia if you gave him a number one wide receiver. Um, you know, it's a shroud if he could run, which he did. And then Max Duggan. Max Duggan. And so here, here's, the, here's the blueprint for TCU. This is a team that has to create big plays, win one-on-one matchups. They've got potentially the number one wide receiver in the NFL draft on the outside in Quentin Johnston, and you have to have a quarterback that is unfazed, one, two, can force the ball down the field efficiently, and three, can beat you with his feet. Duggan does all three of those things. So, listen, I don't know if TCU is going to win, but I am talking myself into this game being closer than maybe what we all are thinking or maybe closer than what Vegas is thinking because of those elements of that team. Now, it would help if Kendry Miller is, is healthy and ready to go, so we'll see if that happens. And if not, then DeMarcado is going to have to go out there and, and be effective, which he has at times, which he has at times. The last thing that I would say is, is that in order for TCU to beat Georgia, they are going to have to make amazing plays late because here's what I know about Georgia they ain't going anywhere this team has championship medal their backs were up against it against arguably the other most talented team in the country they had an 11 point deficit with eight minutes and change left to go in the national semifinal and won the game they're not going anywhere they got an 87 year old quarterback they just won a national championship their standard is so high. They beat Ohio State, won a playoff game. Stetson Bennett played unbelievable in the fourth quarter, and when asked about his quarterback play directly after the game, all Kirby Smart could say is, guys got to play better. I mean, the standard is ridiculously high. That's why I'm going to pick Georgia in this game is because what it takes to beat them, I'm not sure TCU has that. Can they be there? Probably. I think that they will be there. But the championship medal of the Georgia Bulldogs is too strong. 32-1 and one in their last 33 games, they have been the best team in college football over the last two years. They just got taken to the absolute brink by Ohio State. That's going to open their eyes. The way TCU played against Michigan is and should open their eyes. When they watch film of Duggan and his grittiness, when they watch film of an offensive line that is veteran and very good and very big up front for TCU, when they watch a defensive front that was able to stone a very good run game for Michigan, TCU will have the full attention of the Georgia Bulldogs. So in the end, I think Georgia will win this game and win their second national championship in as many years. Having said that, Folks, I think there's going to be points scored, and this is going to be close late. The reason I think that is that in the last two games, Georgia has given up 71 points, 71 in the last two games. They had given up 72 points in the previous six. Why is that? Well, they faced teams that could throw it. They could run it. They've had dynamic play callers like LSU, like Ryan Day in Ohio State, and they're about to have that with TCU. This TCU team will just look you dead square in the eyes, and they will not flinch. They will not flinch Monday night. They're going to be there in the end, and I just think Georgia is going to have a little bit too much. It's just going to be a little bit too much. The roster is very talented. You've got to take Georgia the way they've played over the last couple of years, and I think TCU is going to make this a, a, a fabulous football game. That's how it's going to come down. Now for the, the final piece of exactly how this is going to be won and lost, exactly how all – College football playoff games are won and lost. 
when you look back through the history of this playoff, now we're in the ninth edition of this playoffs, playoff, here's what you see. The team that executes in the red zone and can score touchdowns and convert touchdowns will win the game. Both of those teams did that in the semifinal. It's the reason that they were able to win. This is the one stat that you can say throughout the playoff era has really held in these games. Three of 26 games have been won by the team that lost the red zone touchdown percentage battle. Only three. So the team that can score touchdowns when they get opportunities wins the game. You settle for field goals, you'll be beat. All right, that'll do it for my uh, preview edition of that game. I've got Georgia. Uh, I've got TCU covering. I've got Georgia in the game winning their national championship. They're second in a row, and Kirby puts himself up there on par with uh, even the best of the best in the sport. You can follow us on Twitter at Joel Klatt. You can follow the show uh, social media-wise at Joel Klatt Show. Uh, I will be back with a real-time uh, reaction edition of the Joel Klatt Show. That will drop Tuesday morning directly after that national championship game. We'll get in and record something uh, to have for you on Tuesday morning. And if anything happens from a coaching perspective, namely at Michigan in the next few days, we'll jump on and you'll get, obviously, my thoughts on that. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of the show. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review us. And again, tell a friend because college football is always better when you enjoy it with a friend. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs>